Welcome. My name's Rowdy. I'm the Portland Director for Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. And if you didn't know it, Factory Farming Awareness Coalition is a nonprofit organization that educates tens of thousands of students and stakeholders every year. Uh, we talk about the ecological, the public health, the animal welfare, and the social justice impacts, to name a few, of industrial agriculture and the power of our food choices. It really is our mission to empower people and, and let them know that they can really make a difference. Uh, FFAC has made a seamless transition to the virtual world as you're about to experience. We are offering virtual presentations all over the nation. So if you have any type of group, religious, uh, social, whatever the type of group, if you're a teacher, an educator, we want to give one of these presentations to you. So please reach out to us for those. You can find all that information on our website. Our previous webinars about raising happy and healthy vegan kids, how to talk to non-vegans and nobody gets upset, curbing the next pandemic with plants, all of those and more are available on our YouTube channel. So go check out those webinars. They're very informative and valuable. Uh, we really wanna thank those that donated when they registered. That is huge. That makes all of this possible. If anybody watching today wants to make a donation and help us continue this work that we do, we would appreciate it. We love you all. Um, Please use the, the Q&A function. If you haven't seen it, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your uh, screen and use that to submit questions for Jose. He has a few that were uh, given to him or were sent in before the webinar that he'll answer first and then we'll get to as many questions as we can. If he doesn't get to yours, you can email him personally. All right, let's get to it. Jose Mendez is the San Francisco Director for Factory Farming Awareness Coalition and he is an avid long distance backpacker who has hiked the John Muir Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, the Colorado Trail, Yosemite High Route, and the lowest to high route. Crazy. Most recently he completed a, and I had to verify this with him, a 170 mile loop around Lake Tahoe on the Tahoe High Route and Tahoe Rim Trail, which just sounds crazy to me. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jose, enjoy, and I'll see y'all later. Take it away, Jose. Hi, thank you, Rowdy. Thanks for introducing me. Uh, appreciate everyone joining. Thank you so much for your interest in this backpacking webinar. Uh, really appreciate everyone joining in. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them out in the Q&A section. Um, I have that open, so I can't see them and stuff. So if you do have anything else you want me to uh, like answer or anything that you want me to clarify or expand more upon, just feel free to type that in there. Um, then I get started sharing my screen. So hopefully everyone can see this okay and everyone can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, this is a Vegan Backpacking 101. Um, and just again, to give you a little more information about me, I am the San Francisco Director uh, for FFAC. Uh, I've been a San Francisco Director for since last semester, um, or last fall. I've uh, been vegan for about six years, vegetarian for about 11 years before that. Um, kind of, and my interest in backpacking and the outdoors actually started pretty much around the same time as my interest in veganism and animal advocacy. Um, and I'll talk more about that a little bit in the environmental section, but for me, those two things have been really connected. Um, over the past couple of years, around the past uh, four or five years, I've actually backpacked around 4,000 miles, um, as Rowdy mentioned, on the John Muir Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, the Colorado Trail, Yosemite High Route, and lowest to highest route, and most recently in Tahoe, on the Tahoe Rim Trail and Tahoe High Route. Uh, my trail name is actually Plants. You might be able to see in the little description box here, uh, my trail name, Plants. I got that because obviously I eat plant-based foods most of the time um, and also because I just happen to have an affinity for planting myself on the trail as you can see in this picture. Uh, so I'll give you a little outline about what I'll be talking about today. I'm going over some of the basics of backpacking, um, just a couple of the key terms and kind of the key concepts, um, why we, I do this as a vegan and sort of what that entails. Um, now talking about the gear that I use and the gear that vegans can use, um, some of the food that you can carry or some of the kind of more typical backpacking food and vegan options of that. And then I'm going to finish off with talking about leave no trace and recreating responsibly. Those are the two other concepts, not necessarily related to veganism, uh, but I do want to make sure to talk about those things. Those are really important topics. Uh, so start off talking about some of the basics of backpacking. Uh, when you think of backpacking, there's actually like two kinds of backpacking that most people think about. Um, it's usually travel backpacking, which is more like European style or going from hostel to hostel or place to place, um, like more city oriented. Um, it's usually low cost independent travel. It's uh, 
the same kind of principle in all kinds of backpacking is where you carry everything in your pack, in your back. Um, and then hiking backpacking, which is the one I'm going to be focusing on mostly here, is uh, the, the outdoor recreation that where you focus more on carrying all your gear uh, in outdoor spaces. So usually national parks, uh, national forests, uh, wildlands, wilderness areas. So you're not really moving from city to city necessarily, but you're more focused on being sort of in more natural, pristine places. Um, in each form of these, backpackers carry everything they need for their trips um, in packs on their back, obviously, hence the term backpacking. In the United States, there are hundreds of long distance trails um, and that account to about thousands upon thousands of long distance mi um, uh, miles. Um, this is a map to kind of show you some of the overview of some of them. Um, some of them span uh, across the entire country. There's one that actually spans all the way from the east to the west coast. There's about there's a few that span from the U.S.-Canada border to the U.S.-Mexico border, the Pacific Crest Trail, which I've hiked uh, being one of those. Um, but there's also a bunch of other smaller trails that range anywhere between like 30 to 35 miles, sometimes shorter than that, to anywhere 170 miles, like the Tahoe Rim Trail. 200 miles, 300 miles. Basically, if there's any kind of distance that you can think of, there's probably a trail that's around that distance. And these trails are located all over the United States, um, everywhere from the West Coast, the middle of the country, across the country, a lot on the East Coast as well, too. And a couple other terms I want to talk about um, is when we think of like backpacking, um, there's really three kinds of backpacking trips that people go on primarily. Uh, most normal people go on overnighters. So that's usually just one to two night trips, usually on weekends. That's kind of like a simpler thing. You go to your local area, you do a couple of nights. Um, there's section hikes, and that's when you hike a portion of a long distance backpacking trail. So those trails I mentioned before, the longer distance ones. Um, so you only do a portion of that trail. So you only do say like half of it or like a quarter of it or whatever. And then a through hike, which is considered hiking in the entire long distance trail um, from point to point. Usually if it's a loop, you start from one point and you end at that same point, but you do the entire trail. If it's a point to point, you hike from one point from the beginning to the end. Um, you can different, you can kind of flip flop, uh, means you can hike one part of it and then jump to another part of it and hike another part. So, so that might be a section hike and then you do the entire thing as a through hike eventually. Um, so yeah, so when I mentioned before, like hiking the John Muir Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, those are considered through hikes. So that's the end of this uh, first section. Um, at the end of every one of these sections, I'm going to have these little majestic interludes, which just have cute uh, pictures. Um, in our normal presentations, we usually have cuteness interludes. But since this is a backpacking webinar, I figured it would be nice to include some of these more majestic outdoor pictures to kind of give you an idea of the kind of things to experience uh, while, you can, while you backpack. Um, and again, if you have any questions at this point, um, you can feel free to type them out. Uh, I can get, talk more about gear and stuff um, in terms of uh, food. Somebody asked about if I pack an entire raw leak in my bear can, which is a little inside joke. I'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, this is Lake Aloha. Um, this is in the Salation Wilderness near Tahoe. Uh, it's on set. Um, and if I wear contacts or prescription glasses, um, I will actually talk about my gear and things I carry in the later section. We'll save that one for later. Another question was, uh, when did I first get into through hiking? Um, I started in 2016. Um, usually, I, I've been backpacking a little bit before that, like mostly overnighter trips. But my first real long distance trail was a John Muir Trail in 2016. And that kind of opened me up to the other ones. And yes, we can share the slides later. And we will also be recording this presentation and posting it onto our YouTube page. OK. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about why I backpack as a vegan. Uh, backpacking is really hard. Um, it requires a lot of planning, a lot of coordination. Uh, uh, it just requires a lot of like physical ex effort. Um, so there's a lot of logistics and that kind of stuff um, in place. And so it's very difficult in and itself. And then to do that as a vegan adds another level of complicatedness to it, right? Um, it makes it a little bit more complicated. You have to think about gear. You have to think about all the stuff I'm going to be talking about, the food. Um, so why do I do that? Like, why would I do this as, uh, as a vegan? Well, for me, um, it's for the animals, for health and for the environment, uh, for the animals, obviously I don't want to contribute to the intensive confinement, to the mistreatment, abuse, and killing of animals. Um, like my goal as a vegan and as an outdoor enthusiast is not to contribute to that, those elements of factory farming, of animal agriculture. Like I don't want to go outside into the natural world while I am contributing to the harming of these animals. 
Um, in terms of health, it can help with energy recovery and performance. And when I get to the food section, I'll talk a little bit about nutrition and how sort of I, I approach it. Um, it's not necessarily advice that it would fit for everyone, but it's just what's worked for me over these past 4,000 miles. And then the big one is for the environment. Um, for me, my interest in the outdoors and my interest in veganism are very closely tied together. Um, I don't, when I go backpacking, when I go into these beautiful, pristine places, I don't want to contribute to the destruction. Um, I don't want to support an industry that actively destroys these beautiful places. To me, that would not, th those things are just very incompatible. Like I don't want to be eating jerky while I'm backpacking and knowing that the industry that produces that jerky is also very directly responsible for the destruction of that place that I'm in. And to talk a little bit more about that, um, I'm not going to go super in depth into that. Um, so, but I do want to touch up on a few points. Um, especially this one, this is actually from our environmental presentation. So if anybody is interested in some of learning more about this stuff, we do have an environmental presentation that we can share, share with people. And I will include that in the follow up email. Uh, but this is one of the key things about this is that factory farming and agriculture is one of the single most environmentally destructive industries on the planet. Um, when you think of the biggest contributors to climate change, to pollution, to water use, to land destruction, we think a lot of different industries. The reality is that animal agriculture are the, and the industry that produces our food, a lot of those animal products, is also very directly responsible for the destruction and degradation of the planet. And again, we have a whole presentation that just focuses on the environmental impacts of factory farming. So it's kind of a lot of stuff to go into. Like this is usually an hour long presentation that we give um, and I want to consolidate everything into just one slide. But just to give you the summary points is that factory farming is one of the biggest contributors to desertification, soil erosion, um, deforestation, water pollution, water use. Um, in terms of air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and climate change. Um, in terms of land, 26% uh, of the Earth's terrestrial surface is actually used for livestock grazing. Um, and then one third of the planet of the arable land is actually used for livestock feed crop. So there's huge portions of this country, huge portions of the world, including the Amazon, which have been destroyed to make room for these animal agricultures for the crops to feed to these animals for the cattle grazing operations. Um, in terms of water use, uh, manure runoff is one of the leading causes of water pollution in the United States. It pollutes around 22,000 um, 22, miles of rivers in 22 different states. Um, it leads to things like eutrophication, which causes aquatic ecosystems to collapse. Um, if anyone is a backpacker here who's tuning in, you are aware that if you go backpacking someplace where there's cattle, you have to be very careful with the water you drink because that water ends up being contaminated and it can possibly make you sick. You can get things like norovirus, giardia, cryptosporidium, um, different kind of intestinal diseases um, that are very easy to contract because those water sources are contaminated by uh, cattle operations. And then in terms of air, um, it's a, uh, animal agriculture is a massive contributor to air pollution. Um, there's hydrogen sulfide and ammonia levels that are 10 times higher than legally allowed for other industries around factory farms. And animal agriculture actually causes more greenhouse gas emissions in the entire transportation sector. So again, as a backpacker, as an outdoor enthusiast, I don't want to support that industry. Like I don't want to contribute to an industry that is destroying these places that I'm in. Like this. I like this place. I really like this. This is Thousand Island Lakes in Ansel Adam Wilderness. Um, I don't want to see cows trampling all over it. I don't want to see it polluted. This is a, one of the most beautiful lakes I've ever been to. And the idea of an industry coming in and dumping waste or dumping uh, or polluting the air and contributing to the destruction of this place to me is like something that I just can't, I don't want to support. Um, there's a few other questions uh, kind of related to the previous section. Do I backpack solo or with the group? Um, I do backpack uh, solo. I just had a little poster accident. Hopefully no one saw that. Um, do I backpack solo there? And most of the time I backpack solo, uh, most of the 4,000 miles that I've hiked, I've backpacked alone. Uh, when you're doing a long distance backpacking trip, you do end up meeting a lot of people, especially people who are like, obviously you're, you're, you have something in common with them. So you're doing the same trip. So um, a lot of times you do end up meeting people. So I have hiked with people while I'm backpacking, uh, but for the most part, I tend to hike alone. Um, and if I wear contacts or prescriptions, um, I do wear prescription glasses. I don't use contacts. It's just easier for me to use prescription glasses. And again, I'll talk more about gear stuff later on. And then um, how do I know when I'm ready, uh, when you're ready to go solo? Um, I would say if you want to do it, you're ready. Like, I don't think there's really any criteria that you need in order to 
uh, like be feel ready to do solo. Uh, the first trip I ever did solo was the John Muir Trail. That was actually my first overnight backpacking trip. I was alone, and that was a ten day uh, trip in the Sierra with no cell service. And there, there weren't a lot of ten, uh, people when I did it, so I was completely alone. And uh, I didn't feel ready for it then, but I just did it anyway. So if you want to do it solo, you're you're pretty much ready. If you have all the gear and stuff, you're you're fine. Uh, how do I? Uh, what else? Um, do I bring a GPS tracker for safety purposes? Um, I do, uh, I do, and I'll talk about that in the gear stuff. Um, I think somebody asked about this lake. This is Thousand Island Lakes in Ansel Adam Wilderness. How do you prefer prepare for your first solo trip? Um, I'm going to get to some of these questions later on. So, um, and I can type out the the lake name in the chat because there's a few people asking about it. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, I'll save the, how I prepared for my first solo trip um, so in the Q and A section at the end of this. Um, I wanna talk about gear now. Um, this is something I get asked a lot about, um, kind of backpacking gear I use. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the basics first. Um, for backpacking trips, um, this is kind of the, the bare minimum of stuff that you need. Um, the big three, uh, we can separate into the big, th what are called the big three and the 10 essentials. The big three are your pack, your shelter and your sleeping gear. Um, and there's different kinds of these things and there's all sorts of like things that you can delve more into. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff when I talk about my gear and I'll actually show you my gear. Um, but those are the big three. Those are like the, the pack, obviously the most really important thing where, where you carry everything in. Your shelter, what you use to protect you from the outside, from rain, from wind. Um, your sleeping gear, obviously you need that in order to sleep at night. And then in terms of uh, what are called the 10 essentials, these are 10 things that people need in order to, um, what are recommended by a lot of outdoor um, organizations, outdoor agents, uh, agencies that kind of have a list of just these things that you would you generally like to have in, for a long distance backpacking trip or overnight backpacking trip. Um, these are also sometimes recommended even for day hikes, um, longer day hikes. And these are just things to ensure that you're safe and protected. Um, navigation, headlamp, sun protection, first aid, knife. Uh, sorry, I have this fire, um, shelter, extra food, and extra water. And again, I'll show more in depth of what I carry uh, when I show you my gear. Um, and the first part when we talk about the intersection of like veganism and backpacking and sort of people ask like, what isn't vegan about backpacking gear? Um, so I'm gonna delve a little bit into some of these things um, to give you more information about them and why I refrain from using some of them. Um, starting off, we're talking about down, wool, leather, and then products that have animal-derived glue. Um, so starting off with down, um, a lot of people have probably heard of down products. You may yourself have a down product, either a down jacket or a down sleeping bag or down quilt. Um, down is not the feathers of a duck. It's actually the under plumage um, underneath the feathers, uh, beneath the outer feathers that of um, ducks and geese. It is very warm, it's very lightweight, and it's very compact. So that's why you have things like sleeping bags and uh, puffy jackets that are made or filled with, in, with um, down. It doesn't work very well when it's wet, but it does work well in dry conditions. Um, and because of the warmth, the lightweightness and the compactness, people tend to use it a lot in, in outdoor gear. The problem with it is that it requires a lot of mistreatment of these animals, ducks and geese. They are kept for a lot of the time in intensive confinement, means that they are cramped together into very small confined spaces for extended periods of times. Um, usually anywhere between, um, I, I believe for ducks and geese, it's around six months to a year um, while they're producing these uh, the down. And a very common practice that is used to acquire that down is something called live plucking. I mean, it's basically these animals are held down and they have the, the down, these uh, under plumage actually physically ripped off uh, from, their, from, their, from their bodies. It is very painful to them. It's not done with any anesthetic or anything like that. Um, it's kind of the human equivalent is literally just like ripping off a huge chunk of like human hair. Um, again, and it's done that repeatedly over and over. So the, the down is pulled off it kind of grows back again and then it's pulled off again and they do this over and over. 
Um, people sometimes ask then, what about responsibly sourced down? That's something uh, that is becoming uh, very popular uh, for a lot of outdoor companies because live plucking, like even just the description of it and those pictures you saw, is really a horrifying practice. Um, it is, if you've ever seen a video of it actually being done, it is very disturbing. Um, so a lot of companies have started to switch over to something called responsibly sourced down. Um, think um, companies like North Face, that's kind of, that was created by North Face, um, and Columbia, RAB, Textile Exchange. And they aim to ensure that down and feathers come from animals that have not been subjected to unnecessary harm. There's another company, Patagonia, that has their own uh, standard called the Global Traceable Down. And it's the same thing where they want to make sure that the animals are not subjected to unnecessary harm. Um, both of the criteria are focused on, on animal welfare and traceability. That means that for animal welfare, um, for responsibly sourced down or responsible down standard, they want to ensure that the ducks and geese live under what are called the um, five principles um, of animal welfare, uh, which means that they're free from thirst, um, they have access to food, uh, have space, um, aren't subjected to unnecessary harm, and are killed humanely. Um, Patagonia's are a little bit different. I think there's a little bit more stricter than that. Um, so that's in terms of animal welfare. And then the other big thing is traceability. They want to make sure that they can know where their down is being sourced, where it's coming from. Because um, a lot of the times a company or a, a farmer might say that they are uh, not doing live plucking and they actually are treating the animals well. But if you can't trace it, you can't figure out, you can't investigate those agencies or those farms, um, you can't actually verify that they are actually adhering to these practices. The problem with these is that a lot of the parent farms of like some of these down companies, especially ones that are labeled under the responsible down standard um, are still not traced. Global sourcing is very complicated. It's um, a lot of these products come from overseas in the United States. So around, I think it's around 80% of the down that's manufactured that's utilized actually comes from China. And it's very hard for a lot of these American companies to actually make sure to actually follow the chain of of uh, traceability to make sure that it's actually being sourced from where they say it is and they actually are adhering to the practices and the requirements of these standards. Patagonia's is a little bit stricter. They uh, actually do unannounced inspections. A lot of these farms when they are, when they are uh, notified of these instances or just in general as a general practice. Responsible down standard doesn't actually do that all the times. Um, they tend to announce their investigations and inspections beforehand. And for responsible down standards, um, the parent companies only have to meet around 50% of the criteria that's set out in their standards. But even if you were to actually have really strict standards, you have to investigate and you're able to trace where this down is coming from, the big problem with it is that regardless of their sourcing requirements, regardless of the animal welfare, even if you have the best treatment of these animals, even if you have, you can trace exactly to, the, to pinpoint exactly which farm these places, these down is coming from, it still requires the ducks to be kept in intensive confinement. So very small cages, very small spaces where they don't have a lot of room and it still requires them to be killed. There is no way currently to source um, this responsible source down that doesn't require the eventual death um, and the confinement and death of these animals. Um, the next product you may have heard of is wool. Uh, that's something that's very commonly used as a base layer. So like a shirt material or as a sock material um, because it has very uh, moisture wicking and antimicrobial properties. Um, most of the wool on the, that's utilized even in the United States actually comes from Australia. It's from a type of sheep known as Merino. That's the one you can see on the top right. And Merino sheep have actually been bred to be very skinny and wrinkly, uh, which causes them to produce more wool. The huge problem with that is that because they're producing so much more wool, um, a lot of the, it causes them a lot of distress and a lot of discomfort. These animals, um, a lot of people talk about like, well, she naturally produce wool. We, they need to be sheared in order to be comfortable. Like that's true. But these animals, a lot of the times are left to grow as much wool as possible because it's more profitable, obviously, if the more wool they produce. The skinniness and the wrinkliness of these animals also causes them a lot of harm, cause a lot of stress, especially the wrinkliness. It's actually like, it's, a, it's used to help them grow more wool. But the problem with that is that it then makes those folds, those uh, creases of their skin become very susceptible to infections and to something called um, fly strike. It's basically flies land on them and they actually um, lay their larva in those skin folds. Um, and to prevent that from happening, a lot of the times these, these sheep have to experience something called mulesing. 
it's a practice where sort of a, a huge patch of their their rears are actually stripped away they're cut off again without any anesthetic um, or any painkiller and it's usually is done again to prevent that fly strike to prevent that um, larval and, and fly infection so the picture on the bottom right you can see some sheep who have experienced mulesing Unlike down, there is, there is something called um, responsible wool standard, but it's not as widely adopted as down. So there's currently no company that I know of in the US that actually uses responsible wool standards except for Patagonia. Um, Darn Tough is the most common company you may have heard of in terms of socks. Uh, you hear like wool socks, merino socks from them. They actually source, they claim to source a lot of their wool from uh, the United States. But if you look at their actual statement, it actually says that they do source a lot of it from Australia and from other global sources. And they currently don't uh, adhere to responsible wool standards. Uh, the next product that's also very commonly used is leather. Um, a lot of times it's used in boots and gloves. Um, it's used a lot because it's very durable and very flexible. Um, unfortunately, this still requires a lot of the common farming practices that we experience for animals, for cattle operations, uh, including intensive confinement, dehorning, so cutting off the horns of cows, cattle, tail docking, cutting off their tails, and branding. Um, it is also just incredibly detrimental to local communities. Tanneries where these, this leather is produced um, utilize a lot of different chemicals, dyes, things that are based in arsenic or cyanide as just part of the treatment process of transforming it from cow skin into actual usable leather. And it's very harmful to the local communities. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about in terms of animal products in backpacking gear, outdoor gear, is actually animal derived glue. This is something that it's a little bit harder to kind of like really know about. Um, it's not something that's like you can actually very easily see on like leather, wool and down. Um, but there's a lot of non-vegan shoes that are actually fixed with glues that contain animal ingredients. So there's a lot of shoe companies that use it um, just because it is water soluble and it's, it's easier and cheaper to adopt for um, welding together some of the materials in some of these shoes. Animal derived glue is usually derived from animal proteins, um, casein like milk, collagen from flesh, bone, skins, and tendons. Um, so it's a lot like gelatin where it's actually boiled. You take these tissue, the bones, um, what's kind of like, commonly thought of like horse hooves and boiled down and turned into a glue that's then used in some of these outdoor products. Um, it's derived not just from horses. That's kind of like what we stereotypically think of like, oh, you send a, glue, a horse to a glue factory, but it also can be derived from other animals, including rabbits, fish, and very often cattle. Um, somebody in the sign-up form asked about animal-free alternatives, some natural materials. Um, there are a few alternatives you can utilize. Um, things like cotton is very common. Obviously, most people wear cotton shirts. I'm wearing two cotton shirts right now. Um, the problem with cotton is that it doesn't wick away moisture very well. Um, there's a common expression in outdoor industry um, or outdoor activities that says cotton kills. That's because when it gets wet, it doesn't dry out very quickly and can lead to damp, which can lead to hypothermia long term. So that's, it is a usable material, but it's not something that's very commonly used in outdoor gear. There are other products, things like hemp, linen, and bamboo that are becoming more common, especially bamboo. But these things are not without their problems. Um, they, one, they're not very durable a lot of the times, especially for really rugged activities like backpacking, where you are going through shirts very often, you're going through socks and pants and things like that. Um, just, they just wear out through just normal use. Um, they also do have a very high environmental impact, um, not as high as what I'm talking about next, but they do require a lot of um, environmental destruction, a lot of environmental harm especially things like bamboo products. Uh, the bamboo is becoming a very popular material to use for like things like toothbrushes, combs, um, dishware, uh, stuff like that. But the uh, demand for bamboo has actually caused large portions of bamboo forests to be destroyed. Um, some synthetic materials that are good alternatives are things like polyester, nylon, uh, capilene, which is actually a form of polyester, but it's Patagonia's own form of polyester. And for uh, sleeping materials or, or jacket materials, Climate Shield Apex is a really common synthetic insulation. And somebody asked about this in the questions, and it's also just something that's very common. Um, and the common question regarding synthetic materials is actually, um, aren't synthetic products bad for the environment? 
Uh, you may have heard this, this is something that's very common, very well known. Um, synthetic fibers are actually derived from petroleum. Um, so those, that apex, the polyester, the nylon, a lot of times come from the refinement and extraction of crude oil. So produced from those things. These products are not very readily biodegradable. Um, you can reuse them very often, like recycle them and use them in other products. But obviously that would require people to actually return them in to these industries and for these companies to adopt wider practice of recycling. And, but a lot of times if they end up in the landfill, they don't decompose very quickly. It takes, in, takes sometimes um, decades for these products to actually decompose or to break down. And the big problem with synthetic materials is that every time you wash them, it tends to leach a lot of the microplastics and microfibers that are in those materials. So they end up in the ocean. So if you, for instance, wash like uh, I have here, this synthetic shirt, which we'll talk about more. Um, if I were to wash this just sort of on its own and put it in a washing machine, um, odds are is that it would actually leach a lot of the microfibers and microplastics um, into the water, into the ocean. And again, eventually that ends up in the, in the ocean where different aquatic life consumes those microplastics and they could potentially die off. It could potentially destroy your aquatic ecosystems. There's been a number of studies that have shown that the leading cause of microplastics and microfibers in the ocean actually is from washing synthetic materials. So I know that's kind of a bummer, like that really brings up the question if animal products are bad to use, uh, bad for the animals, bad for the environment, and then the natural materials aren't as good and also have environmental impact, and then synthetic materials are also very environmentally harmful, like what do we use then? Um, these are my recommendations. Uh, first of all, just to use what you have. If you have a down quilt or a down jacket, or if you have a wool shirt um, already or leather boots or something like that, just use them until you can't to replace them. A lot of times these products can actually last a lot longer than we think they can. So you don't have to replace it just willy nilly. Um, just try to use it as much as you can until you, until it falls apart as much as you can. Um, Borrow gear. Uh, there are a lot of different organizations, groups that actually rent out gear. You can rent stuff from places like REI, Sports Basement, um, where you can actually borrow gear instead of buying it and creating new demand for new products. Um, buy secondhand. That is something that's very much recommended, buying, uh, going to a thrift store and buying a, one of these products. Thrift stores are awesome. This is a picture of a thrift store. You can actually find a lot of outdoor gear in thrift stores, things like shirts, um, Sometimes you can even find packs, backpacks, that kind of stuff. So definitely recommend buying used or secondhand. There's a lot of online groups where you can buy used hiking gear, stuff that people are selling, either old stuff or stuff that just didn't work for them, but you can buy stuff. The gear that I'm going to show you when I show you my gear, actually, vast majority of it is actually secondhand. I bought it, most of it online from different uh, backpacking subreddits or, back, or Facebook groups where you can buy gear. If you do want to buy something new, um, I definitely recommend buying from a company that uses recycled materials instead of what they call virgin materials. Recycled synthetic materials are becoming more common. Again, things like polyester and nylon are readily, uh, you can recycle them. Companies like Patagonia have actually started switching over to make using more of the recycled materials um, for their capillary lines and the polyester lines. And they have actually even started to recycle down. That means that they are actually taking old down products and repurposing that down that was used in those products. They're, so they're not buying down from suppliers anymore. They're actually getting it from consumers who are returning some of their old down products and then recycling and reusing the down that was already used in those products. So those are the biggest recommendations. Um, Um, and for synthetics, if you do buy synthetic material like this, uh, recommend that you don't wash it as much as you can. I, that sounds kind of gross to a lot of people. Like this shirt, for instance, I've backtagged in many, many miles in, and I've only washed it a handful of times, which is, people think it's really gross, but if you're backpacking, if you're doing a lot of outdoor backpacking activities, you just kind of get comfortable with being gross. Like I try not to wash it as much as possible. When I do wash it, try to use uh, not try not to use it in like washing machines or places that are just going to dump the water directly into like water sources. Um, there is a company called Guppy Friend that sells a bag that you can actually put synthetic clothing into, and it will capture the microfibers and microplastics. Um, I personally don't have one; I should have one, uh, but um, I've heard a lot of good things about that, and is it very useful? Uh, now I'm going to turn off the screen sharing because I want to talk about my gear. Um, I'm looking at the questions now. So there's a ton of questions coming in and I will happily answer them all in the 
Q&A section. Um, but I do want to go over my gear real quick. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through everything because I want to make sure that I get to the food section and the other stuff. Um, but I will do want to show you just sort of what my backpacking gear looks like. And this is sort of what's called lighter pack. Um, share the link again with you later. Um, but it's basically kind of has a breakdown of the weights of my gear. My focus when I backpack is to have everything be vegan. Um, I don't use down products, don't use wool. And to have everything be what's called ultralight, which means really lightweight material, uh, things that are multiple uses. So I don't have like redundant materials or I don't have anything that I can't use for multiple purposes. And my gear is also very modular. What that means is that I can use it in a bunch of different environments. So the gear that I'm going to show you, I've actually used in the Pacific Northwest, in Oregon, in the Sierra, in the Mojave Desert, in the Colorado Mountains, um, also, and so all kinds of different environments. I'm going to stop my share. So this is my pack. This guy right here. This is a frameless pack. Um, it does not have a frame, so it's not like a traditional backpack where you have like the, either the external frame or you have a frame on the inside. It's just like a big sack that holds everything in it. So you can see it here. Um, it's not very big. It, right now, uh, without any food or water, it weighs around eight, eight, to eight to nine pounds. Um, on the outside, I have a water bottle. This is what I use for water. Uh, this is a Sawyer filter. So this is an inline filter that I just drink directly out of, so I don't have to stop to filter water. Hiking pole, I only use one because I use it for both uh, hiking and for my shelter. Um, I'm trying to use a, not use as much plastic. You saw that that's a plastic bottle. So I've started to use this collapsible or uh, reusable bottle for drink mixes. Um, it's very handy. So I mix things like coffee and electrolyte tablets in it. And then on the outside of the pack, I usually keep some of the like things like extra gloves um, or socks. Those are polyester gloves. Um, I just use like the cheap uh, polyester gloves, uh, polyester socks, sorry. Uh, I have a water bladder. This is what I use when I need to carry extra water. I have a little ditty bag. Um, this is what holds all my ditties. So the 10 essentials, the 10 things I showed you um, in terms of like navigation, compass, headlamp and stuff, all of that is in here, just this tiny little bag. This is my poop kit. This is what I use uh, when I have to go to the bathroom. There's toilet paper in here. There's a bottle of hand sanitizer. Uh, there's a bag to pack out stuff, which I'll talk more about that in the leave no trace section. And uh, soap as well, biodegradable soap. And I have a bug head net. Um, I wear this a lot of the times when I uh, am in some buggy areas and I don't wanna be annoyed to death. A little thing of sunscreen. Uh, there are some sunscreens that are not vegan. Obviously, they use animal testing. This one is from a company called ThinkSport, and there's also Sunbum. So it's just a little like stick that I can use to just rub on my face. Uh, this one is vegan, no animal testing. And then I have Body Glide. Um, this is basically lube that I rub on uh, my back or where like pack rubs or between my legs to prevent any chafing. I have to be very careful to not confuse this with the sunscreen. And somebody asked about GPS uh, tracking. I do use a GPS tracker. This is, uh, this, is this guy. Um, I use this to keep, uh, uh, it basically sends a little, has a map that people can use to track me to keep track of where I am. And I can also use it to communicate even if I don't have cell service. And then again, uh, unfortunately, I just have to go very quickly, but I wanna go over some of the stuff that's inside the pack real quick. And it's not a ton of stuff. Here's food. This is all the, the food I carry, and I'll show you pictures of all what's in here um, in the next section. Then I have a jacket. I use a Apex jacket, so it's just like it's the, it's a puffy, but it's made out of synthetic materials. I have never washed this, so it's pretty gross, but it also does not. It's not that bad. Then this is my shelter. Um, I don't use a, a like normal double walled shelter. I use what's called a bivy, which is basically just a body bag, um, which is very convenient in case anything happens to me. Um, but it's basically just like a sack, a plastic bag that I sleep in. I cowboy camp, which means I don't set up my shelter as much as I can. If it, I only set up my shelter if it's gonna rain or if I feel like it's in somewhere where I want more privacy. 
my shelter is just like this. This is just like, it's a, basically a tarp. It's a, sh it's a shaped tarp that I put over me in case it rains. And then I also just have some stakes that I use to tie it down. And then rain jacket, I just use a cheap, uh, what's called the Frog Talks rain jacket, extra socks. And then my one luxury item that I do carry on every trip is a inflatable pillow. Um, I love having a pillow. I used to use my shoes for sleeping, but it was just very uncomfortable. And then a pair of gloves, polyester. And the last big things are this thing. This is my quilt. Um, I don't use a sleeping bag. I use what's called a quilt. Um, it's basically a sleeping bag without the bottom of it, uh, without the bottom section. When you use a, a back uh, sleeping bag, um, the, what keeps you warm is what's called the loft of it. And when you're sleeping on top of a, when you're in a sleeping bag, you compress the bottom part of it. So you don't really need that. So this is just basically a, a big blanket that is very lightweight. And this one is also made out of Apex. So it's not made out of down. Down is the most common product uh, we're to use usually. And then sleeping pad, I use an inflatable sleeping pad. This is also doubles as the frame for my pack. You can see it's torso length because it only fits my torso, um, which is pretty much all I need. That's pretty much it. I just keep everything inside this plastic bag um, that you reuse over and over. And that goes all in this pack. So again, I'm gonna look over the questions. Uh, there was a question about down. Yes, the meat is sold for consumption um, afterwards. So the down is kind of a byproduct of the, the, the geese, the meat industry or the duck industry. Um, a lot of those animals are initially killed and then their plumage is later off sold as a byproduct. Uh, if the sustainable products for down and wool, are you saying those are okay? Um, I'm saying I, I, I personally don't believe those products are used uh, okay because those animals are still harmed. Um, the, 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 the requirements for both of those say that um, the, they don't have to experience any unnecessary harm, but that implies that they have to experience some necessary harm. And for me, any kind of killing of them or putting them in confinement is unnecessary. Uh, sweating and synthetics thinks really bad. Really, any solutions? Um, synthetic materials have come a long way. Um, capilene has been improved a lot. So if you do want like a synthetic material that doesn't smell as bad, I re definitely recommend uh, capilene. I do you uh, vegan boot brands. I'll actually mention those um, in the next in the later on. Um, a stance on using poles as walking sticks. I use one. I only use one for usually for backpacking. No shovel and my poop kit. Do I use something else instead? Yeah, I use a tent stake. Um, I, I do have, I did used to have a shovel, but I actually lost it. So now I just use a, one of my stakes is actually a little bent. So it's like a little hook, so which works perfectly. How do I deal with mosquitoes without a tent? Um, I hike all day and basically by the time I make camp, um, they usually go away, usually later at night. I also use that bug head net. So that pretty much prevents them from um, biting me in the head and stuff. And I wear pants and long sleeve shirts. Do I ever use a bear canister? Yes, I do. In fact, it's right here. This guy, giant thing. I put my food in here, mostly only when it's required. Um, I otherwise will just sleep with my food. Um, I don't make, I don't dehydrate my own meals. I just buy prepackaged stuff, which I'll talk about in the next section. Low weight protein. Um, I'll, again, I'll talk about that in the food. Um, as far as gas burner goes, I don't actually use a stove. I use this thing. This is a Talenti jar. Um, it's basically a gelato jar. I got the vegan one, which is a mango sorbet, which is really good. So I basically, I put my food in here and then I let it reconstitute for a few hours and then I eat it straight out of the jar. So I don't use a stove. Um, I do have a stove that I occasionally bring on uh, this thing. It's just a tiny little stove that works really well. Um, for the most part, I don't use um, 
I don't like cooking just because it takes too long and I don't like cleaning dishes. So I just use the, uh, the little Talenti jar. All right, uh, next on, I'm gonna move on to talk about food. Um, I realize that I have a lot to get through, not a lot of time, but I wanna make sure I can talk about food. Um, for me, my goals with backpacking food are to do use food that's uh, vegan, light, healthy, and cheap. Um, those are my biggest priorities, obviously. Um, vegan food is the most important thing for me. Um, I will carry extra weight if I can't find anything that's really light. Um, if it's not, if it's vegan and lightweight, but not necessarily healthy, I'll make that sacrifice. Um, and a lot of times I'm personally willing to spend a little more money to buy all this other stuff. Um, but if I can find cheaper food, especially on like longer trips where I'm spending more time in towns or spending, have to spend more money on resupply, um, I do try to prioritize cheap food. Um, so this is what I typically use for breakfast. Um, it's, I do a lot of bars, as you can see from these next couple of slides. Um, Cliff bars are all vegan except for the whey protein bars, which is very unfortunate that they decided to do that. Um, but all the regular Cliff bars and the Cliff nut butter bars are vegan. Nature's Path is a great brand. You can find them pretty easily in a lot of stores um, and they do have a lot of vegan stuff. And they're great because they actually very clearly state whether or not their products are vegan or vegetarian right on the packaging. Um, again, I don't, um, I don't cook breakfast most of the time. So a lot of the times I'll just wake up, eat a bar or two, and then start hiking. Um, if I'm spending, if I have a little more time, I will carry the, the nature's path oatmeal or just regular oatmeal with some chia seeds or whatever. And I'll just cold soak that as well. Uh, for lunch, my big thing is I like to have a really variety of food for lunch. So I usually do like peanut butter tortilla wraps peanut butter uh, or tortilla hummus wraps because um, it's really lightweight. Um, it's been nice to do. I have powdered hummus that I use a lot of the times, but most of the times I'll just use peanut butter because it's just very calorically dense. Do a lot of dried fruit because I want to try to get as many nutrients as possible and like, you can get some, a lot of stuff from dried fruit. Um, a lot of the primal strips jerky, love carrying that stuff. And usually I'll carry something salty as well too, something like the harvest peas or maybe just like chips like uh, Fritos for instance are vegan and they're usually really high calorie and very light. For snacks, I carry a lot of bars, um, builder bars again, all vegan, um, except for the whey protein ones, don't get those. Um, Lara bars, those are like the better, healthier ones, and they're usually pretty cheap and you can find them a lot of places. Um, not even that superfoods one, I was actually able to find this one in a lot of different stores, which is really nice because it's got like turmeric, ginger beet, a lot of other stuff. And then for dinner, again, I don't cook, I don't carry a stove, so I just carry this jar. Um, I will do a lot of cold soaking. So I will put things in the jar at lunch and then add water and then eat them for dinner later on. I do a lot of couscous. Couscous is very easy to find in a lot of different stores. Uh, ramen, uh, these fancy ramens are ones I can find. If you can't find them, the, um, the, the normal like 79 cent like oriental packaging ones or the soy sauce flavored ones, those are the ones that are vegan accidentally. So you can use those as well too. Optins is really nice too. If you, it's a little bit heavier, but it is very delicious and it will actually reconstitute as well too. And for desserts, usually do Oreos and Justin's peanut butter cups. I do carry uh, some nutritional yeast and this thing, a little jar of hot sauce that I usually sprinkle on everything. Um, there's a question uh, in the sign up about pre-made vegan dehydrated meals. Um, there's a couple of companies that do have vegan pre-dehydrated meals. Uh, Backpackers Pantry is the one you can pretty much find in a lot of regular outdoor gear shops. Uh, Mountain House, unfortunately, don't think has any vegan stuff. They have vegetarian things, but they don't have vegan specific ones. But Backpackers Pantry does have a few vegan ones. Food for the Soul is another great company. I think these are more, these, these you might be able to find in some stores, but I think that you can find most of them online. And the one that I really recommend that I love because they're delicious and everything they sell is vegetarian or vegan is outdoor herbivore. These I've only been able to find online and in a very, very one single place that I was able to find it on, on, in person, but that was because they got theirs as a sample from the company um, who just gave it to them. But so outdoor herbivore, it's a great company. I think it's gonna be posted in the chat. Um, so you can learn, you can, you can check that site out. Oh, there it is. 
Um, the last thing I want to focus on is nutrition. Um, when you're doing a long distance backpacking trip or just a regular overnight trip and stuff like that, um, it's very easy to not get the right nutrients. A lot of people focus on times of like getting garbage food. Like you just get a lot of junk food. I've hiked with people who only eat like pop tarts for breakfast and the, the really high calorie sugary uh, cinnamon rolls um, that you can just find at a gas station. And for me, that stuff is like, disgusting and it's not very healthy um, and it makes me feel really bad when I eat it. So I focus on trying to eat the stuff I showed you, but I also really focus on getting really high carbs and fat uh, because that's usually where I can get more calories. I tend to eat higher protein foods later in the day. So those builder bars that you saw, they have 20, um, 20 grams of protein. I tend to eat those last in the day just because I feel like it helps me recover from the day of exercising. Um, I'm not a nutritionist or a registered dietitian or anything like that. So definitely do your own research on that, but that's just what happens to work for me. Depending on the length of the trip, I try to eat around three to 4,000 calories a day. Um, and when I was backpacking on the Pacific Crest Trail, towards the end of the trail, I was eating closer to five to 6,000 calories a day, and I was still losing weight. Um, so you do have to kind of make sure you carry as much food as possible. I was carrying a ton of extra food, and I was still eating all of it because when you are hiking 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day, you tend to burn thousands upon thousands of calories. Uh, when I get to a town, so usually the way long distance backpacking work is that you carry a few days of food and you hike from town to town, basically. Um, and then in town, you either send yourself a box or you resupply in that town. You, you go to a grocery store or there's a convenience store or something where you can buy additional food. Um, so all this food I showed you is stuff that for the most part you can find in most common grocery stores like Safeway, or Walmart, Target, um, places like that, that are, that are more sometimes common in towns. But when I get to a town, I also make sure to point to stock up on veggies and fruits. Um, when I get to a town, my first thing is usually to buy as a bunch of fruit, uh, like berries or just apples or things like that, that I can't get while I can't eat while I'm backpacking. And then I will pack out a healthy meal usually that day. So if I'm leaving town that morning, I will pack out like a dinner for that day, which is usually something like a salad or a veggie burrito or something that's a little more substantive and has more nutrients, more vitamins, that kind of stuff. Um, very important thing, B12 is also a big issue. Uh, definitely carry a B12 supplement if you're gonna do this as a vegan. Um, I carry just those little like, um, those uh, the lingual ones, the ones that you just put in your tongue. And I also carry nutritional yeast, which I sprinkle on everything pretty much. Uh, B12 fortified nutritional yeast. All right, so again, there's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. There is a new chili flavor of Top Ramen, which is vegan. Oh, the Cliff Fruit Bars are not vegan. The nut butter ones are, but the fruit ones are not. My average daily mileage on the trail when I'm backpacking, it depends on the trail, like something like the Pacific Crest Trail, I average 24 miles a day. Um, and the Colorado Trail, I think I average around 25 miles a day. So that's usually a pretty standard. Um, and, but on my last trip, I ended up averaging closer to 20 miles a day. If I'm just doing like an overnight trip, it depends on who I'm hiking with. That might be anywhere between like less than 10 miles a day and stuff. But, but on like longer distance through hikes, I like to do them pretty fast because I like the physical challenge of it as well too. So I do tend to go a little bit faster. Good to go also makes a lot of yummy vegan meals. Good to know. Uh, calories per ounce. Do I aim when picking out foods? I aim for about 110 to 120 calories per ounce. So for, for every one ounce of food that I'm carrying, I carry around, and again, 120, usually on the low end, 110. So that average is that for me for about, uh, for 4,000 calories or around two pounds of food per day. Any experience with trail running? Um, I am actually more of a trail runner and runner than I am a backpacker. So I'm doing this presentation on vegan backpacking because I do have a ton of experience with it. But if you, everyone's ever interested in a running, vegan running webinar, I can totally do that as well too, because I actually, for uh, trail running, I have, I think almost 9,000 running miles. So I have definitely more experience as a runner than I do as a backpacker. How do I avoid the fire season? Like right now, it's really bad. Um, uh, this actually happened to me on the Pacific Crest Trail. I actually hiked through Northern California uh, when the campfire was going on. And I don't know if anyone knows that, remembers that in 2018, that was the, uh, the biggest fire in California's history. So I um, had to hike around that. So there were days where I was literally hiking in and out of valleys of smoke. 
Uh, in those instances, if I have to hike near there, um, I will just wear a respirator, the N95 mask. So I had two of them when I hiked in Northern California. Um, but honestly, for the most part, I just avoid backpacking and hiking while spires are going on. I had planned to go backpacking this past weekend and unfortunately I had to cancel my trip because of the smoke conditions were really bad. I was planning on going to Tahoe and the Tahoe air quality there was terrible, so I just avoided it. Um, yeah, if you are in the middle of a long distance through hike and you have to hike near fires and stuff, um, one, make sure you're paying attention to the fire closures because it happened to me is I got to a town and there was a fire closure the day I got to town where 30 miles of the trail were closed. So I had to skip around it. I had to get or find a ride from someone online to the, where the fire was reopened again. But generally, um, I honestly would never hike through smoke ever again. I did it because I was in the Pacific Crest Trail and I really wanted to finish, but it was just very uncomfortable. It was not very fun hiking in very smoky conditions. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, vegan collagen supplements. Um, I don't actually know of any. That's a great question. Um, let me do some research and get back to you. I've heard of mixed things about collagen. Um, I, so I don't really know too much about it. I've never used it as a supplement. Um, so I, I do know that people sometimes occasionally do it, especially athletes. Um, for bad knees though, the, the big things I would recommend um, using either a knee strap, um, that's something I see a lot of hikers you commonly carry, or using hiking poles. Um, I love using hiking poles for like down, for uphills, and they help me get traction, they help with, bad, with um, balance. So I definitely recommend hiking poles for anyone with bad knees. I have all kinds of like injuries from running and I definitely rely on hiking poles a lot. Do I have any experience tips for adding TVP to foods? I do, I use TVP a lot in uh, the ramen and the couscous. You can just add like a tablespoon or a fourth of a cup to anything. And TVP is great. If you don't know about it, it's textured vegetable protein. Uh, I actually do have some of it in my it's in the food bags, but um, yeah, it's basically these little pellets and you can uh, add it to anything. It's really high in protein, it's very lightweight and it will absorb the flavor of anything you add it to. So you can add it to like the ramen, the couscous. You can even add it to beans. Um, I do like rehydrated, uh, uh, the refried, dehydrated refried beans and it will actually just add an additional protein, additional calories and it just tastes like beans. So yeah, I use that all the time too. Landing a wilderness permit, um, it depends on where you're going. Um, there is actually a website called Wandering Labs where you can input a place that you are wanting to check out, like if you want a permit and it will notify you when permits become available. So you can look up. Um, Um, I don't usually worry about ticks because I hike with pants and long sleeve shirts and I do chick checks really often. The only place I've ever backpacked where I really worry about ticks is Henry Co State Park um, in Bay Area because there are ticks everywhere there. So number one, I just avoid hiking there because it's not that much fun anyway. And I wear pants and I wear long sleeves. Um, if I was backpacking somewhere in the East Coast, uh, like the East Coast where ticks are a huge problem and there's a lot of instances of Lyme disease, I would treat my clothing with permethrin, um, which is a bug spray that repels bugs, um, animals and things like that. Um, I try to avoid using any kind of bug spray because as a vegan, I don't want to purposefully kill animals. Um, so I just try to use things that are like clothing, like the bug head net, long pants, long sleeve shirt, button up shirt that is, um, that is tight, has a tight knit so that it, bugs can't bite through. And that way I can avoid just, I can just hike right through swaths of animals and stuff, or bugs without having to worry about them. Uh, realize that it's now two o'clock. Um, I do want to finish up. Um, if anyone wants to stick around, obviously you're welcome to. Um, I want to make sure that I get to everything. The last two things I want to talk about um, are very quickly. Um, there are things that are not necessarily related to the vegan backpacking stuff. And if you have, again, if you have more questions, feel free to add them in. Uh, but I want to talk about leave no trace. Um, leave no trace is a principle, a, a set of seven principles that helps to ensure that we preserve a lot of these wild open spaces. Um, these are the seven principles. It says number one, planning ahead and prepare. So when you are planning a backpacking trip, when you're planning a day hike and things like that, make sure you know like what the conditions of the trail are, what if there's any closures, um, if there's anything like that, like if there's fire damage, if there's areas that you should avoid for any reason. Um, so just make sure you plan ahead, you look up these places before and you prepare. Travel and camp on durable surfaces. Um, don't go off trail if you don't know what you're doing. Um, stay to trails as much as possible. 
I do a lot of off-trail backpacking now, um, especially on routes, which are off-trail things, which for me is a little bit better for leave no trace because there's less impact. Um, I still take a lot of care to when I step somewhere, I don't step on flowers, I don't step on grass. I step mostly on dirt or granite or anything like that's more durable surface. Disposing of your waste properly is very important. Uh, I mentioned my poop kit. Um, it is a, just like I use a tent stake. I dig a six, with, this is how you go to the bathroom, um, in case you've ever wanted to know. So you get a shovel, a little travel shovel, or you use a tent stake like I do, or a stick or your hands, and you dig a hole that's at least six inches deep in the ground. You try to find a way, 200 feet away from any water source, at least 100 feet away from any trail. So kind of go off into the distance, somewhere where you won't be seen, but also where you, people won't just come across your, your little hole. You dig a six foot hole, you drop your pants, go to the bathroom, um, and then you, when you do your business, you wipe up, you clean up, whatever, and then you bury it. Um, again, bury, make sure it's completely covered, make sure you tamp the ground down, make sure that it was completely covered, and you pack out whatever you use to clean up. Um, if you're using toilet paper, make sure you pack it out. That's why I have a separate baggie that's just for used toilet paper. Um, just do me this huge favor. If you get anything from this, Please don't leave toilet paper in the backcountry or any place you're backpacking. Um, it's super gross. I was in desolation wilderness um, a few weeks ago, and there was a spot where I was camping, and right behind there was a little grove of trees, and it was just completely covered with toilet paper. Like that's the one thing that is just it's bad for the environment because animals eat that toilet paper. They dig it up, and they try to eat it because they think it's food, which was very bad for them. It's bad for just the ecosystem. That stuff, when it gets dug up, it doesn't biodegrade, especially if it's like scented toilet paper. It won't, it won't uh, decompose. And it just lingers there forever. And it's just an eyesore and it's really disgusting. So just make sure you pack out your used toilet paper. Leave what you find. Um, a lot of people like to take souvenirs from their places. But the problem with that is that if everybody does that, then you're disrupting this ecosystem. If you're plucking flowers or if you're taking ro nice rocks or things like that. Um, it's just, it's a cumulative effect. Um, if a lot of people do that, then you just en end up destroying those places. Minimize campfire impacts. Um, make sure you know how to make a campfire and how to turn it, put it out properly. Uh, make sure that you are pouring water on it, that you're checking the temperature to make sure it's properly off. Wildfires are a huge problem. Everybody knows that here in California, we know that fires are a huge problem. There's a, ours are caused mostly right now by lightning, but there are a lot of fires that have started because of negligence, um, because of leftover campfires, cigarettes, fireworks. Um, some of the most destructive fires in, in, that, I've, that I've seen uh, have been caused by, human, uh, by humans and by just not caring uh, for these kinds of impacts. Um, the other thing was, uh, what's this? Oh, sorry, respect wildlife. Um, don't feed animals. Um, it's really enticing to give like a little nut to a marmot or a squirrel or something like that because you think it's cute and you wanted to take an Instagram picture of it. Don't do that. Don't take pictures of animals. Don't, don't. You can take pictures of animals, but don't feed them. Don't condition them to people. Uh, bears are a huge problem, especially. Make sure that you are using whatever the area you're in as part of planning and being prepared use appropriate bear uh, equipment and that might require a bear canister if you're someplace like the sierra or even tahoe has a lot of problems with bears um, colorado it's not as uh, much issues with bears and stuff so a lot of the times um, you can get away with just carrying like an earth sack which is just like a bear proof sack or um, one thing that i do personally not everyone's very comfortable with this but i sleep with my food um, i keep my food close to me um, just to make sure that rodents and other animals can't get to it. Most animals, and this is something that people freak out a lot about, bears are not, don't want to mess with humans, um, especially on the West Coast, especially. Um, bears are very afraid of humans. We, any bear that actually does mess with a human ends up being killed eventually. So most of the bears try to avoid humans. It's a, unless it's um, like a mother bear or something like that. Um, those are the ones you want to avoid. But most of those, they'll, they're very skittish. They're basically just big raccoons. So um, again, it really depends on the area um, where you're going, but a lot of times, again, I'll sleep with my food um, and that's just better because a lot of people do what's called a bear hang. That means that you, you hang your food from like a tree or something, but most people don't know how to do this properly. Um, it's a very specific way to hang your food. It's called the PCT method. It's really the only more effective way. And most people will just dangle their food and think that's fine. A bear ha can climb trees, black bears especially can climb trees. Um, they can easily bring your food down and then they'll, they'll associate bad bear hangs with getting food and that creates a problem for the people that camp in those areas. 
Um, that's only for black bears. Um, that's not for grizzly bears or polar bears. Those are completely separate kinds of bears. Um, with grizzly bears, carry an ursac, carry a bear canister. Polar bears, if you see a polar bear, odds are you are hiking somewhere very remote and you should probably know what you're doing at that point. So I don't have a ton of advice for that. Um, and the last thing um, I want to finish up with, oh, sorry, one last one, uh, be respectful of your visitors. Don't play Bluetooth speakers. Don't play loud music and stuff. Make sure that you are respecting all your fellow hikers, your fellow backpackers. Um, you know, just make sure you're inclusive to them. Make sure that you're not being a jerk while you're backpacking. Be a good steward. Um, and there's, uh, again, thanks everyone for sticking around. I'm gonna finish up with talking about recreating responsibly and answering some questions. I apologize if I have not gotten to your question yet. I will try to make my, do my best to get out to every question. Again, this is being recorded. So if you do need to sign off um, or if you don't wanna continue with this right now, um, we will be posting all this to our YouTube page and you will have access to this video later on. But I wanna finish up, lastly, talking about recreating responsibly. Um, the, we still are in a pandemic. Uh, we, a lot of places, California is still in, in phase two, phase three. Um, we still have a, a very potentially dangerous virus that is affecting a lot of people. Um, so we want to make sure that people are still recreating responsibly. Um, so we want to make sure that, again, it's a lot of similar stuff to leave no trace. Know before you go, plan and prepare. Make sure that there's no closures or there's no restrictions for the place you want to go to. Um, definitely make sure that you have the necessary equipment that you need for a trip. You don't want to be rescued because that puts the lives of the SAR teams and the rescue teams at, at stake. They requires them to then quarantine afterwards if they come into contact with you. So you just want to plan and be prepared before you go anywhere. Carry a buff or a mask, uh, mask are great. I use this buff that you can see here. So when I'm backpacking, uh, this is what I look like. Um, and it's very easy for me to just put it up. There's a lot of different conflicting um, information about transmission rates, especially in the outdoors. I will say that it seems like the transmission rates are much lower when you're in outdoor space, but you still wanna make sure that you practice social distancing, especially on narrow single track trails. You don't wanna be like right next to someone and then breathing all over each other. So try to give one another space, six feet apart at least, uh, wear a mask if you can, if possible. Um, play it safe. Again, just taking, take every precaution you can, um, err on the side of being more cautious. I know that's a lot of asking a lot of people all the times, but it's not as big of a sacrifice as people think it is. Like if I'm hiking on a trail and I see someone coming at me, I will just turn away, stand, look away so that I'm not coughing all over them, let them pass, or I put my mask up, or if there's a wide enough trail, I'll just take a step away. It's not a big deal. Stay close to home. Um, try to go someplace that's local to you. For my last trip, the reason I went to Tahoe was because it is just a two hour and a half hour drive away from me. So I was able to get there and back without having to stop for gas, stop for resupply. Um, I, my partner was able to pick me up, uh, drop me off and pick me up. So I don't have to worry too much about um, like coming into, coming into contact with other people. Once you're on trail, it's pretty safe. Um, you don't have to be around other people as much as you want. You can stay apart from people. So that's nice. But once you get the trailheads and when you get to town, um, that's when you come into contact with a lot of people and you just wanna make sure that you're close to home so that in case anything does happen to you, you don't have to be stranded someplace. Leave no trace, respect the seven principles, again, I mentioned. And then the big thing, obviously, with the current culture and climate, um, build an inclusive outdoor space. Um, make sure you're welcoming to people if you are backpacking and stuff like that. Everything that I mentioned, a lot of it's suggestions. Um, a lot of it is just information that I've kind of acquired over the, my travels and over my few years of backpacking. Um, but the big thing is like my goal with this is to share this information, make it as inclusive as possible. So I do not just for like wealthy middle-class people, not for like just white people and not just for able-bodied people want to make sure that we can make this as inclusive a space as possible. Um, for me, that goes along hand in hand with veganism of being compassionate and trying to um, not cause harm to anybody. For me, that, that extends to this last principle of building an inclusive outdoor space. Uh, and the next thing, um, more resources to get started. Um, we're going to send you a follow-up email that has both the links to this present to this video, a webinar, and also uh, some of these links that I'm sharing with you. Um, if you want to learn how to get started backpacking, REI Backpacker and Outside Magazine also have a bunch of great resources. 
if you want to learn about ultralight backpacking, like all the lightweight gear I have, um, the ultralight subreddit is a great resource. There's a very comprehensive wiki, wiki there and uh, frequently asked questions there. Um, if you want to learn more about vegan backpacking and hiking, there's a Facebook group that's also super useful. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can just email me, jose at ffacoalition.org. Um, and then if you're on Instagram, you can also just send me a message there at Plants Hikes. Um, that's where I post all my vegan backpacking stuff. So if you like the pictures uh, in between all the different sections, um, follow me there because that's where I post them all. I know it's a ton of stuff and I know I went over time, so I definitely appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, there's a few questions that were signed in um, while uh, they were sent in during the registration process. So I want to answer them because I don't think I responded to them during the presentation. Um, and again, if you have more questions, post them in the chat and I will reply to them. Um, any recommendations for a combo hike camp with a town or two that is cool and vegan friendly? Um, that really depends on the distance. If you are interested in like just an overnight trip, a lot of places like in the Bay Area, there's a ton of places. Um, it's kind of hard right now because of the fires, um, but some like the Marin Headlands and stuff, it's pretty easy to do an overnight in those local towns. Um, more nationwide, um, Colorado is a great spot. There's a ton of backpacking there. Um, but there's a lot of similar issues with fires right now going on. And again, pandemics, um, there's a lot of like the Salt Lake city has a ton of great backpacking as well too. Um, but those are just, those are the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, as far as like through hikes or long distance trails that are really nice and easy to get started. Tahoe Rim Trail is one of my favorite trails for beginners. Um, if you want to learn more about like long distance backpacking through hiking, um, that's 170 miles. It's very easy to resupply. You want to, you actually stop in the middle of a very vegan friendly town, Tahoe city, where you can resupply, um, post COVID. Um, you can take some precautions. If you do, if you do it now, like worry, definitely respect uh, social distancing and recreating responsibly, but they do have a lot of vegan options in that town. And it's, the trail actually passes right through town. So it's super easy to resupply and to pick up vegan stuff. Um, and it's also just a very beautiful trail, um, Desolation Wilderness. That first picture I showed you of uh, Lake Aloha, that's where that picture was taken from on the Tahoe Rim Trail. Um, if you were interested in a longer distance trail, um, sections of the Pacific Crest Trail are very vegan friendly. Um, Northern California um, is not thought of usually as the most scenic place on the Pacific Crest Trail, but it is very beautiful and it is very vegan friendly. Like there is a bunch of towns, Aetna, Quincy, that you actually can go near that actually have natural food stores, uh, different co-ops where you can get a ton of vegan options. And good websites and brands for finding and buying vegan hiking boots. Um, so there's two, um, there's Vegan Outdoor Adventures and uh, which is, is not as uh, active a website right now, but it do have a lot of information about different vegan products. And the big one that you can use that's very easy to use is REI. REI actually has a great search engine that you can actually filter by vegan options. So they, if you look up, like if you just type in boots or vegan boots, it'll show you all those results. And we just posted the link to that in the chat. Um, I personally don't use hiking boots. Um, I use trail running shoes. So I use these. Um, these are just some um, trail running shoes. These, these, this pair alone has around 700 miles on them. Um, so I use these very often. Um, once they get like a little worn out, I'll replace them. Uh, but these are these are from a brand called Ultra, and all Ultra running shoes, except for their walking shoes, are vegan. So they are all synthetic, um, and they don't use their they don't source their glue from animal products. So I really recommend this brand. Um, it's a very common backpacking trail running brand. And then advice for resupplying along the way instead of sending food from home. Um, there are a lot of resources that you can utilize for uh, learning about the resupply options in towns. For the Pacific Crest Trail, I actually found a spreadsheet that listed every single town you could resupply and the vegan options that was compiled by a, by a set of different vegan hikers who had hiked it in the previous year. And I actually updated it myself as I was going through town. So if you look up like vegan PCT resupply, you should be able to find that spreadsheet. Um, and again, we'll link it to it in the follow-up emails. Um, or you can also just email me and I can send it to you because I also did my own vegan PCT resupply guide. Um, the, the, a lot of the times just search whatever trail you are looking, you're wanting to hike and type in vegan resupply, Colorado trail, Tahoe Rim trail. And a lot of the times you will find a lot of resources on that. Um, a lot of times you will find my resources on that because I tend to post a lot of that stuff on myself. Um, well, the trails I hike, I do like resupply guides. Um, so if you're interested in any of that stuff, I try to keep those updated as much as possible after I hike those trails. Um, but yeah, just search vegan resupply 
trail. That's the easiest thing you can do. And then Doe will give you more information about different resupply options along town. Um, a lot of the times the places might not have a ton of options. If it's a very small town with just like a gas station or a liquor store, you might have to send yourself food. Um, that's a common practice is to send yourself what's called a resupply box. It's just a, a box that you send, you fill up with your food and then you mail it ahead to yourself and you pick it up along the way. Vegan brands for shoes, um, Ultra, again, REI has great options. Poles, um, most poles are pretty vegan um, because they are a lot of times just use carbon fiber or aluminum. Um, they don't tend to use animal products and they are mechanical locks. So if they have like, they have like cord locks, so you don't have to worry too much about um, using any animal products. Packs, um, again, most packs that are just like uh, nylon or um, Cell Poly or even uh, what's called uh, VX07, uh, DCF, uh, which is Dyneema uh, Composite Fiber. It's a very lightweight fabric. That stuff's all vegan. Sleeping bags um, and Lighten Equipment has a Apex line of quilts. Um, That's what I use, the Lighten Equipment Revelation. Um, it's an Apex brand. Um, I'm gonna turn off the screen sharing before I continue. Um, and if you, again, if you look up like REI, if that's what you're using to purchase products, just Google, uh, when you are looking at REI, sort by synthetic. That's the easiest option. That's the easiest way. Uh, do I wear contacts or prescription glasses? I think I mentioned this. Um, I do wear glasses. Um, I wear, um, just regular these, these glasses. And then for sunglasses, um, I use, I bought my glasses from a company called Zenny Optical. So they actually came with clip on sunglasses. So I can actually just have a pair of lightweight things that I just clipped directly to the top. Uh, do I hike in areas with brown bears? Um, so I've, I've hiked in areas with black bears very often. And I've hiked in areas where there are a lot of black, brown black bears. That means that there are black bears that they are like honey colored or golden colored bears. Um, as far as brown bears, um, most people think of, when think of brown bears, it's actually grizzly bears. Um, grizzly bears, I have, I've only been in areas where there might be grizzly bears, mostly in Washington. And then it's, we're unsure if there's some in Colorado through some of the areas I passed through. But I, I do have plans long-term to hike through Wyoming and Montana because there's a bunch of long distance trails there and there where, where there's a lot of brown bears or grizzly bears. Black bears are very common. Um, the PCT has black bears all along the line. On the PCT, I actually saw, I think around 14 bears. Um, and then through all my backpacking, I've seen dozens of bears. Like I've seen them all over, uh, mama bears, cubs, teenager, full grown bears, something like that. I've been within a hundred feet of bears before. Um, if you look at my Instagram, there's actually long ago, there's a video of me like about a hundred feet away from a bear that I was on the trail. Bears are very skittish um, for the most part, black bears on the West Coast anyway. Um, so if you make noise, you can startle them. I've startled a ton of bears. Um, they don't, unless you are like literally bumping into them or hitting them or anything like that, or if you're uh, approaching a cub with a mama bear, then, then you, bears are like not as big of a worry. Obviously give them space and respect them and be loud and make yourself known. Um, don't try to take pictures of them close up. Don't try to hug them. Um, but uh, yeah, you can just, you can, most of the time you can scare away bears. How did you prepare for my first solo trip? A um, lot of research. Um, I spent a lot of time looking up videos on the trail that I was hiking, the John Muir Trail, um, like sort of the requirements. Um, for the John Muir Trail, there is actually a guide by a woman named Elizabeth Blank, and it's fantastic. Um, a lot of these trails do have guidebooks, and I definitely recommend if you're interested in one of these trails, buying one of those guidebooks. So the John Muir Trail guidebook was incredibly useful for that. Um, but YouTube videos, um, a lot of people like to record their hikes, their blog, they like to vlog while they hike. And that's a great way to learn more about these trails. Like just look up like Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, Colorado Trail, anything, and odds are you'll probably find a series of videos on these trails. Vegan boot brands. Um, I don't know of any vegan boot brands. I personally don't use um, vegan boots. Uh, but again, if you look at Vegan Outdoor Adventures, they have a list of brands. I know that Sportiva and um, I think uh, REI have their own vegan brands, um, but I've never tried those, so I'm not sure. And there's some recommendations for nutrients like raw barley grass and wheatgrass powder. Um, powdered greens are great. Um, you can find those. They sell like little satchels of powdered greens that you can just add to drink mix or add to food too. Those are great supplements. And then someone mentioned living silica, which I think is the collagen supplementation. 
Um, I don't have a solar power charger. I do bring a phone and in my ditty bag, um, the way I keep my stuff charged is um, this one. This is a little battery pack. Um, it's a 10,000 milliamp battery. So I can just plug my phone in directly to this and this will charge both my phone, my, um, if I have a camera or a camera or if I have like anything, my Garmin, it'll charge that up. So this is just what I carry. And then when I get to town, I just plug this into a wall outlet and I charge that up and then I use that between towns. Um, you heard all not, not all brands are TDP are vegan. Do I know any good brands? Um, I think uh, Bob's Red Mill is definitely vegan. I'm pretty sure there's ours. Um, that's pretty much the main one I buy. That one's you can find pretty much in most stores, um, usually in the Bob's Red Mill section. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, bulk sections where you can buy TPP. So those, I think those are kind of the pans, but I think a lot of them come from Bob's Red Mill. Picardin prevents bugs from detecting you. It doesn't hurt them. Uh, good to know. Um, yeah, so Picardin. Um, so there's two main bug sprays that people use. Um, there are, oh, TP, toilet paper. Sorry, somebody may have, uh, corrected that it may have been toilet paper instead. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Like I definitely just buy a like, regular toilet paper. A lot of times I will just take toilet paper from a uh, bathroom that I'm happy to hiking through. Like a lot of the times, like you don't want to, you don't want to just buy a huge roll, so you'll just take some, whatever you need for that hike. So a lot of times, that, I'm not too sure about that. Um, uh, bug spray, again, there are, there's three kinds of bug sprays that are most commonly used. Um, well, four if you count the natural ones. Um, there's DEET, which is kind of like the DEET spray. That's the most common one. Um, that stuff, people respond differently to it. So there's been some people who say that they make them nauseous or they make them a little bit lightheaded. Um, the biggest problem with it for me is that it is potentially um, can harm gear. So if you spray it like on a synthetic material, it can potentially dissolve it or cause some wear to it. Picardin is another one that's used as an alternative. Um, it's supposed to be very effective as well too. I have used it a few times, um, but I ultimately just switched to using like the hard, the, the barriers, the physical barriers over using sprays just because I wanted to carry one less thing. Um, and it wasn't as effective as just wearing a head net. Um, the other one is permethrin. That's something that a lot of times people use to spray on their gear so that animals are repelled from their gear themselves. The people will spray it on their clothes or their packs or their shelters. Um, and then the natural one is citronella. That's something that a lot of people carry. Sometimes people might carry like a little citronella candle. I've personally never had it work, um, never had it effective. I've used dozens of them and I've never, I've seen mosquitoes just land near the candles and not be afraid of them whatsoever. The best experience I've had uh, through hiking, um, that's very hard to answer. Um, I, you saw the pictures, some of the ones I posted on, in the intermissions. Um, all of those are probably some of the best experience. Most of the sunsets and sunrises that you can see. Um, hiking in the Sierra my first time on the John Muir Trail was probably just the whole thing. It was very difficult, it was hard. I did it in 10 days, which is a lot faster than most people normally do. So there was physically very challenging. And I just, um, yeah, it was magnificent. Like it's, if I, anyone ever wants to do a trail, the Tahoe Rim Show is really beautiful and amazing too. But the John Muir Trail is mile for mile, probably the, one of the most beautiful hiking trails. It's 220 miles and there's not a single bad mile on that trail. Um, have I ever done any rock climbing while backpacking? I have actually on the Pacific Crest Trail. I actually stopped in Big Bear and um, I, I happened to meet someone online and it was a trail angel and she took me rock climbing. So while I was in the middle of this 2,650 mile hike, I went rock climbing just for an evening. Um, I have also done rock climbing, um, like scrambling in the middle of hikes as part of the hike on the Yosemite high route and the lowest to highest route. There are sections that are completely off trail that you have to scramble up. And I had to do that. So there's like class four, borderline class five sections. Um, that, that means is that it's very technical scrambling with, with falls could be potentially fatal. And we did have to scramble up mountain passes or to some of the tops of the peaks um, in order to actually go to those points. Uh, Will's Vegan Shoes. Yes, that's a company. I've heard a lot about them. I've never used any of their stuff before, but I've heard that they are awesome. Yeah, so definitely check those out. Um, some of them, um, again, there's a lot of companies that do have stuff. Merrill has vegan products that you can sort through in their pages. Um, they also make a lot of boots. That's the other one I was trying to think of. Um, and they do have shoes, minimalist shoes, but also hiking boots that are vegan. Um, but definitely check out Will's hiking boots. 
called World's Vegan Boots. And then do I bring a map? Um, I do, so I don't know if you can see, but I have my maps up on my, the wall behind me. Um, I do carry those. But for the most part, I actually use uh, apps. There's a few apps that you can um, download. Um, there's All Trails, Gaia, Earthmate. Um, for long distance backpacking, there are, there's an app called Gut Hooks and that you can actually purchase um, the exact trail that you're hiking and it has information. It's a lot of crowdsource information. Um, I use Gut Hooks on most of the long distance trails I do, but a lot of times I will also just um, use Gaia because that just allows me to see where I am on the map. And it will actually tell you exactly because it's GPS enabled so you can actually track yourself. But I do carry paper maps and I do have a compass. I have a tiny little, I don't know if you can see this, but it's a little tiny button compass that I carry with me. Um, this is not um, kind of a, a substitute for like really intense navigation off with a comp map and compass. This is just for orienting. Um, so I can tell which way is north, south, east, and west. And then I can kind of orient myself on a map. Um, it's definitely a very useful skill to have is being able to read a map and know how to navigate using a compass and that kind of stuff. Um, but but I do rely on phone a lot. And I think most hikers nowadays do rely on phone a lot, but always know how to use the map just in case your phone dies or I've had my phone die on me before or I've dropped in water or I've just run out of battery. And I was very glad I had maps um, just because I can use those to navigate as well too. I don't know if there's any more questions. I think that's all of them. Um, thank you everyone for sticking around. Um, sorry I went over, definitely appreciate everyone's thinking, everyone who stuck around. Um, again, we will have all these resources that I mentioned, um, the webinar and stuff, we will send that all uh, to everybody as a follow-up email, to everyone who registered and who's here now. Um, thank you so much for letting me talk to you about vegan backpacking. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, if you have any more comments or anything like that, uh, I'll stick around for a few more minutes, um, but you can also just email me at jose at ffacoalition.org or on Instagram at Plant Hikes. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Jose. That was excellent. Who knew that there was so much information? Anything you... Anything non-vegans can do, we can do vegan. That's not right. That includes backpacking. All right. If you have more questions, Jose is going to stick around for a second. Um, if you found this valuable, there is a donation link in the chat, and we would appreciate your support so we can do more things like this in the future. This was great. Nice job, Jose. Uh, the, next, the next webinar is September 24th, and it's going to be on effective outreach. So tell your friends. And again, all of the webinars, including today's, are available on our YouTube channel. Awesome.